So we are joined today by Bethany Yancey, a cult and coercive control specialist. Bethany has a master's degree in the psychology of coercive control and is formally trained as a counselor. And you can visit her online at freefromcontrol.ca. So Bel uh, Bethany, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Randall. I'm, I'm excited to be here and to have this conversation with you. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so you are described as a cult and coercive control specialist. I thought as a launching point, why don't we work through those two concepts? So let's start off with cult. What is what is a cult? How should one understand it? Yeah, so there's different conceptualizations of it. Um, and some people, they kind of go right to the more extreme end, like, for example, of a cult in history that ended in the death of lots of people like Jonestown or something like that. But what we're really looking at is we are looking at an ideology or a leader who cultivates extreme devotion and commitment to that person or to that leader and requires great sacrifice. And we'll see a lot of other components such as um, like a lot of inflexibility in thinking and really setting the stakes high in terms of claiming that they have access to a special level of knowledge or insight that can really change things. But then the really kind of foundational factor of it is that um, it's not really a, a matter of helping the people within that group. So then anytime a member poses a threat to the reputation of this organization or person, there are really harsh um, repercussions for that. Um, but yeah, like at its core, we're looking at extreme devotion or commitment to an ideology or a person surrounded by a system that really entrenches control that seeps into like so many areas of people's lives in a way that really undercuts their critical thinking and their ability to really examine and understand what's going on like as they experience life inside this group. That was a lot there. Uh, yeah. Maybe start with this, that uh, so cult, people tend to think of that as a religious thing. Mm -hmm. But from what you describe, it could be broader than religion. It could involve a political movement or social movement, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I think we see a lot of examples of cults that have a religious, appear to have a religious like central nature to it but that's just because there's like such a long-standing respect um, for religion and an acceptance of it it's kind of like if we look at Christianity it's got a very normalized presence within our culture and so people who are exploitative and who are calculated recognize that um, so but if I started a cult around my own ideology then I have to work really hard to get people's buy-in. So I have to convince them that they want what I'm pitching. But if I base it around something that already exists and then distort it once people get in, I don't have to work as hard for that buy-in. But yeah, you can have cults and high control groups around, like we can have cults within business settings, within self-development groups. We even talk about abusive relationships really being like a cult of one. Um, so you can actually have a cult revolve around pretty much anything. Yeah. I so see you use the term in the high control group. Um, what is the relationship between that concept and the concept of a cult? Yeah. So I actually use the word cult. I'm really like thoughtful about when I use the word cult, because for a lot of people, it does conjure up a very flattened and oversimplified version of what I'm talking about. Um, but when I have more time with people, like in this, I'll use the word high control or high demand because that really, to me, gets at the core characteristics of a group. So a high control group and a cult are the same thing, but it's just about if I have the time to kind of explain and deepen people's understanding. Um, and also in some situations, I really don't want to trigger a defensive reaction in someone if I'm trying to help them or I'm concerned about them. And I'm going to point more to the level of control that this group or this ideology has over their life and their thinking. Guessing that the concept of a cult, in a sense, is not a binary. Rather, it's like you either are or are not in a cult, or this either is or is not a cult, but rather it's more 
a family resemblance concept and that something can be more or less like a social movement, religious group can be more or less cultic or high control in mm -hmm. its manifestation. Yeah. So I think to like having devotion to something is on its face a good thing. Um, but if your devotion leads you to have a level of inflexibility in your thinking, then it actually has a level of psychological control that's showing up in your ability to cognitively grapple with anything that might come up. And that's where we see things like cognitive dissonance come in. And that's where people who are scrupulous, unscrupulous will use devotion and commitment as a way to control people and to trap people. But yeah, it's not really a a black or white thing. I mean, in more extreme examples, um, it can be more clear, but there are like really helpful frameworks that help us understand and evaluate the level of control. And one that I really recommend and use a lot because it's easy to understand is Stephen Hassan's BITE model. So BITE is an acronym and the B stands for behavior control. The I stands for information control. The T stands for thought control and the E stands for emotion control. Mm. So if we're looking at someone's involvement with a group and we look at all those domains and it is expressing strongly in those domains, then we can say like this is has is resembling a high control group on its impact in your life. Yeah, the bite model. I, I really recommend people if they want to look that up. Agreed. That's, that's a great acronym. For yeah. Sure. Very snappy. Um, for coming from myself, growing up in an evangelical Christian tradition, the word cult really had a specific usage, which overlapped with some of the stuff you said with respect to high control uh, and these bite characteristics, but also was a little distinct. I think, for example, the, maybe the perfect example, Walter Martin, who founded the Christian Research Institute, wrote a book called Kingdom of the Cults. Hmm. And what he goes through there are essentially splinter groups from Christianity that are heterodox or heretical in their doctrine, and also to some degree have some of these other manifestations of high control. So mm -hmm. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, uh, Christian Science, Armstrongism, which were, I think that one's, or the Church of God, I think it is. So some of these, like that one, I think it's gone by the wayside, obviously Mormonism, still very much a force and so on. Mm -hmm. um, on that view, Christianity can't be a cult because these other things are cults by definition that they've left Christianity or distorted it. On your view, or not your view per se, but on the view that, that you're describing here, mm -hmm. this common sociological understanding, it sounds like cult is something that could be manifested to various degrees in various expressions of Christianity. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, like, there's like a common kind of understanding that maybe just like the Christian fundamentalists are the ones who are high control and could be described as a cult. But then I've seen like evangelical fundamentalism, um, yeah, so it's interesting. I think we really, it helps when we kind of broaden our understanding um, and we're not being as reflexive in terms of being so so quick to dismiss this idea that there might be high control aspects within our own religious experiences and faith communities. Or I, I would take it like mainline or liberal Christianity or Catholic, various expressions of Catholic Christianity, they could all be cultic to some degree or have coercive or no, we haven't talked about coercive control yet as such but yeah. high control is that fair? yeah yeah and I think too like this is when the leader is really important and the culture that they establish will tell me a lot about what they are cultivating as a culture and whether it is about high control um, and whether what they really value is conformity and compliance over um, expressing doubts or criticisms or individuality. Um, so looking at the leader and the culture of a church will tell me a lot about the health or unhealth of those dynamics. So let's talk about coercive control as a concept and then how it relates to this concept of high control groups or cults. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so coercive control, um, again, there's lots of conceptualizations, but it was actually primarily developed to explain and understand abusive relationships uh, because so often our culture has really oversimplified domestic abuse to the violence that will be inflicted on a partner in a relationship. But what um, coercive control really gets at is the type of attachment, psychological dependence, um, cognitive thought stopping that is cultivated and fostered by the person with more control in the relationship. So Evan Stark, he's a pioneering theorist, and he just passed away, actually, unfortunately, a little while ago, but he talks about different things that we'll see. So in his conceptualization of course of control, we'll still see things like um, isolation, intimidation, humiliation, threats, and sometimes violence. Um, the thing about violence is that you really only need to have experienced like one incident before the threat of that becomes very effective at conditioning compliance in a relationship. And so, but his theorizing is so instructive and useful when we look at how people respond within controlling environments. But really coercive control can be looked at any kind of intentional, strategic, calculated behavior, a pattern of behavior that is meant to harm another person and instill fear as a way to control them. So anything that someone does repeatedly, intentional and strategically to dominate another person is coercive control. So this concept of violence, we're gonna think about violence as the infliction of physical pain, let's say upon another person, certainly mm -hmm. one understanding or one expression of violence. But I'm taking it that this expression of coercive control within a, let's say a Christian environment that the threat of violence could be much broader than just like the threat of corporal punishment of congregants. Like there could mm -hmm. be other ways of thinking about it or having that threat given to the congregation or to the group. Yeah. I think too, even of threats on a level of like existential threats, mm. like threats to our salvation even more broadly than like th the threat of being cast out or like excluded from this group or like shamed or like labeled as um, being an apostate um, or like someone who's deceived. But yeah, there's so many ways on a broader institutional level and then on an interpersonal level that we can use threats and fear. Is Christianity just in and of itself a high control group or does it have tendencies towards a high control group? Because we talk, for example, about having this maximal fidelity to following Jesus. He's this central figure around which the Christian organizes their life. Everything should be devoted to him. Uh, we should totally deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow him. Is that coercive control? Um, so I think it can lend itself quite easily to coercive control. And I think a lot of the theologies and doctrines, particularly the beliefs about the self, and this is going to be different whether or not you're in a reform tradition, um, or whether, yeah, kind of your view of the self, um, is going to play into this a lot. So I don't think Christianity is in of itself a high control group, but I think that the person who wields it, the person who translates it, who dispenses it, who preaches about it, I think that depending on what they want to emphasize, there is potential there. And really any kind of belief system that claims to offer an ultimate hope um, and a higher understanding of the spiritual and physical realms, it has potential for that because of what it's claiming for sure. Okay, so Christianity in and of itself is not course of a high control group exhibiting course of control, but in some expressions it could be. What specific doctrines 
maybe of Christianity or particular to specific expressions of Christianity would be some of the risk points for force of control being exhibited. Yeah. So I think about any church or pastor that really hammers a lot on different teachings that have a tendency to inculcate a sense of shame and worthlessness is going to be a huge factor. Um, other ones is where um, they really center a power imbalance. So they really view men as being the ones who are called to lead and women are called to follow. And um, women, we have a tendency to be misled and deceived. So like any kind of church where they're really heavy handed in a way that will actually make a particular group of people more vulnerable to control is, yeah, definitely very concerning for me. Maybe let's unpack both of those for yeah. a moment. So worthlessness. Uh, I, I I read a quote, we'll say, recently from a well-known Calvinist, a Reformed preacher, where he said something to the effect of, even in my best moment, I deserve nothing more than hell, something like that. Uh, now this, on the one hand, I see it as well-intentioned. It's coming out of a recognition that for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God, you know, Romans 3.23, in sin mm -hmm. did my mother conceive me, Psalm 51.5, I think it is. Um, and then just, uh, we're saved by grace through faith, not through works. Some basic doctrines underlying this well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. The way that is expressed, seemingly that there's nothing redeemable or good intrinsically in human beings, is is that would be an expression of of a, a high risk for inculcating the worthlessness and shame that could lead to a course of control and abuse? It's my view that it is. And I would also go further to say that that's what the research shows in terms of what hooks people in and what disables their ability to think that they deserve better and that they can formulate an escape plan are things like shame and worthlessness. So yeah, this idea that like, ultimately I deserve death, um, depending on how that's framed and how often that's emphasized. Yeah, I definitely think that could be part of a picture of coercive control. At the very least, it can make someone very vulnerable to coercive control. Okay, power imbalance. So what kind of power imbalances could we be talking about here or should we be aware of? Yeah. Um, so I think this is where kind of the, yeah, <laughs> I am picking my words carefully because I want people listening to this to continue to have like a level of openness. So I'm just being really thoughtful here about this, but I think that, so a power imbalance on its own is not bad. Someone having authority in a simple form is not bad, but if that is entrenched and given like a spiritual justification, um, kind of like maybe like a touch not the Lord's anointed kind of view of, of, of clergy and of pastors, it's going to make it really hard for people to be able to offer any kind of criticism or even accountability if this person frames themselves as being kind of God's mouthpiece and like a, they have a direct line to God and in their church, you want to look to them. So someone who fosters that kind of power disparity and then attaches a spiritual justification for it is going to have a lot of unchecked power. And I also just question the, um, like even for that person, if that is a healthy role to be placed in. It's like for a lot of churches, it's part of this tradition of clericalism and this honor and trust that we give to our spiritual leaders. And historically, that's kind of been the norm. But when we study power and authority and we study abuse, 
we see that psychologically, there are so many ways that people can be primed to hand over their trust to people who haven't earned it. And a person standing on a platform in front of a podium or a lectern holding their Bible, talking about how God called them to this position and God revealed to them this, is priming us psychologically on so many different levels to accept what they say and give it more weight than if this person was just on the street and they interrupted us walking our dog and said the exact same thing to us. So that's when I think that we really need to have a look at the impact of power and authority in these structures in our churches. Uh, you referenced in passing when we talked about cults, Jonestown, so Jim Jones taking his congregation, I think generally affluent, well-to-do San Franciscans, I think it was, if memory serves, to the jungles of Guyana and setting yeah. up this community and then having everybody commit suicide by, I think, eating cyanide lace jello. That's the story. Um, oh, Kool-Aid, sorry, not jello. Yeah. Hence the expression, drinking the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. um, but, but from what I'm hearing, the Christian communities from like a very charismatic with a high uh, deference to a prophetic figure through to like traditional hierarchical Catholic sacerdotal tradition where the priest has the sacraments and wields those sacraments as vessels for spiritual life for the congregation, that can all be potentially problematic. Do we end up saying that, well, maybe Christians should all be Quakers or Plymouth Brethren or something where it's, it's well, of course, Plymouth Brethren has its own issues, but uh, like the, the complementarian issues, but but in terms of the sort of one level where there are no leaders, formal leaders as such, is that a safer environment to guard against some of these dangers? Or is that one also vulnerable for these kinds of power relationships to emerge? Yeah, I really think it's about the way that you view and hold these authority figures and whether or not there is a level of accountability that is allowed to be baked into that structure. Um, and so that's where I think I have these issues where pastors will, it, it appears like, like they have accountability, but they really don't when the rubber meets the road or we see, I don't wanna step on people's toes, but we see churches where it's like a father and a son, like it's basically like a family dynasty. and. I think that those situations can be ripe for abuse because it might appear that there's accountability, but I honestly sometimes question if there is accountability. And just one thing about Jonestown, um, I want to just make a comment that, um, yeah, his church in San Francisco, I believe, was the first integrated or one of the first integrated churches of its time. So for me, politically, I would have been drawn to that, his vision for the body of Christ not being segregated, for it welcoming, welcoming people of all races, and for actively taking a stance around the racism of that time that was so embedded in that society. So I think like it's interesting that at the extreme end, we're all like, oh, like I would never get drawn into that. But if you look at the beginnings of these groups, there was a reason that they drawed people in en masse. And I look, read that account of that and I see like my vulnerability, what might have drawn me into that. So I wanted to, yeah, just flesh out that a little bit. I didn't know if you if you had heard that or not. Ah. Uh, not specifically, I don't believe. Was it the People's Temple? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a great uh, reminder, though, that uh, we always want to think of ourselves as somehow standing apart from the warp and woof of coercion and manipulation. But to recognize that any one of us in different circumstances could get lulled into one of these groups is a pretty sobering prospect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like it's our passions and it's our our values that will be weaponized against us to draw us into these groups. Um, 
Yeah. So we even have like intellectual, like kind of cults that really center themselves on like really upholding critical thinking and really like freeing themselves from the lower base, like impulses of ourselves. Like we literally can see these cults and high control groups found around every kind of ideology. So I always tell people when people say, I would never get drawn into a cult. I say, there's a cult out there for you. And I honestly mean that like for every single person, there's a group out there, an ideology that will be very appealing to us. I am just reminded of, uh, I just looked up the title to remind myself, a documentary about Tony Robbins called I Am Not Your Guru. Fascinating, and I highly re recommend it for people. And it's it's pretty sobering how you realize the irony of it all is that he has become this quasi-spiritual authority for people, and he's a deeply flawed human being, among other things. Mm -hmm. So you can you definitely can see it. And of course, like I, I grew up in, in an era of Amway, and then it mm -hmm. became quick star. And then I think it went back to Amway. But but there's a, a very cultic sort of, um, and that becomes an economic movement of social betterment and that. But uh, you can yeah. definitely begin to see these, these high co coercion and cultic traits being manifested throughout society once you begin to look for them. Yeah. And Tony Robbins is a great example. And so are MLMs because... They really prey on our idea that we can be more, we can have more. So actually the like self-development space is like mm. very ripe for these kind of controlling, controlling groups. And then you see someone who like really rises up like Tony Robbins, who has this like iconic status, um, but yet like he's just a human being. So whenever people are elevated to that level. I always think like they're pinning so much of their hopes and dreams on this one person in a way that simultaneously diminishes what they think is their own ability to think logically and to make sound decisions and to connect with other people who can bring value and insight. So it's interesting when people really glom on to a specific leader, what that also kind of does to their own sense of self and self-concept. Mm. Um, the, the reference to multi-level marketing also reminded me of an experience in high school, so going back to the 1980s, where um, um, a, a friend of mine, an adult friend, he invited me out to this meeting, which was a multi-level marketing meeting, and I was like a young and dumb 16, 17-year-old, and this guy is saying, I have such a burden for the church, and I was just praying, Lord, show me how I can bless your church and he gave me this, and then he draws what essentially a multi-level marketing scheme on the whiteboard. And he says, you know, the Lord wants to give us money to achieve his kingdom. So what would you use money for? And I was thinking, I, I'd get like a brand new Ford Bronco. This would be awesome, because I was really concerned about the kingdom of God. So I paid my $50, and I was trying to sell these whatever useless leaflet magazine that they had. And then get other people to sell it. And I thought pretty soon I'd be making, you know, tens of thousands a month. Within like a month or two, they were shut down by the Canadian government. And Whoa. of course, $50 was in retrospect, not a bad price for the lesson I got. So, um, yeah. And I wonder, like, in the span of your development and experiences, how long that actually lasted? Because people tend to wash out of multi ML, like MLMs fairly quickly. But some people, the chances are if they spend more than a year, they will spend multiple years in it. But it sounds like you kind of washed out of that system fairly quickly. Yeah, yeah, fortunately, I, I got through it quickly. And although I had a few of my friends rolling their eyes as I was trying to sell them subscriptions in the school hallways for a few yeah. weeks. And I actually, I have seen some cases of multi-level marketings companies kind of shred churches and spiritual mm -hmm. communities, particularly in cases where it's the pastor's wife who is selling it and mm -hmm. literally turning the church into a kind of, turning the sacred community into a transactional one for financial gain, which we can make a lot of parallels to different scriptures and accounts. But yeah, I think to this idea um, of that God wants us to have everything we need. Um, 
this prosperity gospel kind of sneaks its way like hand in hand with MLMs. And then also it really adds to this idea that God has given us everything we need um, and he's revealed it to us. So, and I find actually a lot of particularly supplement MLMs um, are actually like were founded by Christians and claim that God revealed to them this compound in the soil or this coenzyme that is like a, amazing for our brains as just proof that God has really given us like everything we need for abundant living, abundant in lots of ways. So it's interesting, multi-level marketing and like religion and faith communities, I feel like are just can be a very toxic combination very quickly. That's, that's fascinating. We could talk about that all day because I, for example, I used to uh, lecture on when I was talking about hermeneutics interpretation of the Bible and how people would misuse the Bible. And I'd give the example of the Daniel diet where they would cite the book of Daniel in order to justify this particular diet. Yes. And then that gives it a patina of authority, but it's just mm -hmm. misusing the Bible altogether. Yeah. Listen, um, time's running out. Uh, we're getting near to the end. So I wanted to come back to power and balance mm -hmm. for a moment and get your thoughts specifically on complementarianism and gender relations within the church, because I think that's a huge one for a lot of people. Uh, is that have a risk of this kind of abuse and how would one avoid that? Yeah. So it definitely does because it's making not just one person, but an entire group of people defined by a single characteristic of their gender. It is fostering an environment in which they have much more risk of harm. So when we look at complementarianism, we see that, um, and I'm talking not necessarily about the theology because I'm not a theologian and what I did my research on was the way that they communicated it, framed it and how they applied it in real life, which is why I chose to use um, the association of the Christian biblical counselors, some of their outputs and sources as part of building this conceptualization of how they apply this in real life. Yeah, so I evaluated complementarianism insofar as it is how it is communicated, how is it how is it framed, and then looking at how it is applied to real life situations. And um, what I found is that while in with their words and what they say, they will talk about how men and women are equal. Um, and they will even claim that it is a protective thing for women, that women thrive like in this structure of authority um, with God, the husband, the wife, and then the children. And um, of course they infuse it with this language of it being like God's plan for us and how we can really thrive and grow. Um, but then like in practice, what I found was that there was a real pattern of devaluing the contributions women make. So devaluing their personhood and what they bring to the table. So like their intellect, their instinct, their ideas, their skills. And then at the same time, really elevating men um, and even elevating their preferences. So um, really believing that this husband is really like God to this wife here on earth within this marriage. And so the idea being that even his stated preferences for what he likes to eat for supper or what he would like to do on Saturdays with the children, that his preferences carry a level of like higher spiritual wisdom and insight. So you have the simultaneous devaluing of what makes women individuals, everything that they bring, and then this elevating of men's, even just their preferences. Um, because what I found over and over was that what the woman's role, role boiled down to was her submission her compliance and her deference for her husband. So then in this way, like there was nothing really that she brought that was unique or reflective of her 
individuality and expressions of her personhood because what she was valued for primarily was her submission. So then you don't need people who have different skill sets. You just need compliance. And so that, and this obviously is on a spectrum and can show up in different ways, but churches that really center around this theology and really even make it like a core part of Christianity, they teach on it and emphasize it in a way that a woman's submission is really part of like a spiritual practice and a discipline that is part of the way that she lives out her faith and that she pleases God. So you can see that the stakes are very high for this and the scope of submission and the scope of the husband's potential control is potentially huge. Like it can roll downhill very quickly into coercion. So I found also that these spaces that really center on this view at the same time, they really don't have the kind of off ramps or protective mechanisms that would really mitigate those risks. Um, so if people want to believe this interpretation of scripture, that's one thing, but then not listening when people are coming forward and saying, I've been harmed by this. And because of your teachings on divorce and submission and forgiveness, I spent years in a marriage that if I wasn't a part of this faith community, I would have left a long time ago. And we see things like um, this idea of that a unique type of influence that women have and can weaponize against the powers of evil in their relationship is their submission. So this idea of winning your husband without a word, just with your pure conduct and behavior, that that will change his heart. But you can see how that is such a passive stance to take and how that negates her agency, her ability to act in a way that can change situations in her life. So, and then another kind of off-ramp or a way that there could be an opportunity for intervention that so often isn't there is that a lot of these churches do not encourage professional regulated counseling. So they really operate as a closed system. Um, so they set themselves up as the ultimate authority on all of these things, including whether or not they believe that postpartum a depression is a real thing or whether it's just a sin issue. So you can see how for the people in these systems, the people with less power, this is very dangerous. And there's not doing anything to really mitigate the risks um, for those people in these systems. As, as we move toward a uh, conclusion here, mm -hmm. I think it'd be helpful, maybe big picture to, um, what would you say to, to churches leadership, the congregants who definitely want to avoid these pitfalls and um, protect themselves from becoming more cultic or exhibiting this kind of course of control within their communities. What can they do, practically speaking, in order to form their communities in a way that protects them against these dangers? Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good question. So I would say, um, like when we go back to the BITE model, Stephen Hassan's model of behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotion control. So looking for in each of those domains that there is a way that there is an outside path that someone can keep those domains open. So for example, a pastor who says, don't listen to other pastor sermons, only read these books, they're slamming shut that domain of information control. So churches that encourage them, their members to listen to other sermons, other pastors to go to conferences within their denomination and without other in with that outside of their denomination. So just cr like breaking through this idea of information control, um, like honoring that other people have expertise and scope and ability in caring for people when people are struggling. So recognizing that pastors shouldn't be counseling people when they should be seeing someone who is a trained trauma therapist, those kinds of things. So not having a closed system, having external 
groups that people can go to to say there are concerning dynamics happening within this church. So yeah, we're just looking for opening the door in all these domains, the control of behavior, information, thought, and emotion. So I just think, hmm. yeah, anything that's going to reduce isolation is going to be a big factor and encouraging people that the outside world is not this big, scary place. And their church isn't the church that has the corner on how to interpret scripture. So dismantling some of these things that really build up this fear and foster dependence, things that work against that are going to be really helpful in protecting the autonomy of the people within the group that have less power. Excellent advice. And that will help take a bite out of coercive control. All it's right. Perfect. Bethany, it's been great having you with us. Uh, very important, salient topic. And we look forward to, to seeing more about what you're doing in this area. So again, I'd encourage you all to check out Bethany online at freefromcontrol.ca. Bethany, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Randall. It's been a pleasure.